If you find your place there in 1 Timothy, if I were to take a theme from this book, it probably is, and certainly falls in line with every chapter, as Paul exhorts Timothy about how he ought to lead, and he puts it this way, how folks ought to behave themselves in the house of God. Now, he's not talking about behave in the sense of uh, discipline, but how they ought to carry on the business of the church. But he starts off in this first chapter in a very interesting discussion because every church is going to struggle with this. And it's not just one particular church. And it's not unrelated to what we've talked about the last couple of weeks because Timothy is also going to be exhorted by Paul to rightly divide the word of truth. He's going to be told to study to show himself approved. So as he starts the the idea, the, the premise of that is because there's so much false teaching that hinders the church. You know, this is an early uh, writing from Paul. He writes to Timothy. He writes the book of Galatians, what to do but to correct erroneous teaching. Um, he writes over in uh, 1 Corinthians to, co- to correct uh, carnality. Um, even that early, there were already people who were coming in Uh, 2 Corinthians, there were plenty of critics of the Apostle Paul that were trying to undermine the church. And so here again in Timothy, he says, Timothy, watch out, because there are going to be people who will uh, tell you what sounds like the truth, but it's not the truth. And he says, you need to know it so well that you're able to combat that. You know, the, the way you get people to believe a lie is to mix it with the truth. You know, if I wanted to poison somebody, and I took a, uh, maybe some um, liquid that looked green and nasty and algae-filled, and it was bubbling at the top and, you know, it, nothing, you, and, and dropped a little arsenic in it, that wouldn't be all that dangerous. But if I take a glass of nice water that looks very clear and appetizing and put just a little bit of arsenic in it, well, that little bit of arsenic ruins the whole cup. It looks enticing, looks like it would help, looks like it would be nice, but it'll kill you. Well, you know, Uh, The devil doesn't come and and, uh, try to convince people of stuff that is necessarily outlandish. Now, some people believe things that are outlandish. But the masses are pulled in by what sounds like truth mixed with error. Now, you look in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and Paul writes down here, first of all, he charges Timothy, and he says in verse 3, he says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now, he's telling Timothy he's got a responsibility. He says, you're going to be among these people there at Ephesus, and I wanted you to stick around because I wanted you to, uh, to intervene when people tried to teach false doctrine. It was going to happen. Now, the biggest threat they had were those that knew the law, the Pharisees, and tried to mix that law with grace. Really, the entire book of Galatians was a a book that Paul wrote. Of course, the Holy Spirit of God gave him the words, but uh, the occasion of the book was that people just like this had come in, and they were undermining the progress that these people had made in their Christian life. That is, they hadn't rightly divided the word of truth. They were wrongly dividing the word of truth, and they usually used the Old Testament law, to do that. Now, those people are dead and gone, but their great-grandchildren are still at it. I mean, people will take biblical terminology, uh, biblical accounts, often Old Testament passages. You know, one of the great books that people love, not a lot of people, but some false cults like to use, is the book of Ecclesiastes. They go over to the book of Ecclesiastes, and it says, the dead know not anything. Well, there's a lot of politicians that don't either. So, I mean, they're still alive. That shouldn't throw you off too much. Uh, can, and who, who in the grave can praise God? And, and they'll take things like that and teach something as ridiculous as soul sleep, that a person dies and they're completely unconscious until the judgment. Um, they'll, they'll go to places and pick out one little proverb, one little statement out of Proverbs and pull it out and form a whole doctrine off of it. Now, the, every statement in Proverbs is the Word of God, but it's got to be placed in its proper context. So you have people that were dealing with that here. He said, Timothy, I'm charging you that you charge. In fact, he besought Timothy. He says, I'm beseeching you to charge these people. In other words, that's a pretty significant term to say, look, 
you're part of the so-called church. Uh, God's given me authority to come in with the truth and say, that's false. You know, there's nothing wrong with combating false doctrine. Now, you don't focus on false doctrine. You focus on the truth. But when you preach the truth, it combats false doctrine. Now, there's some subtle ways that people do this. He says, Timothy, I want you to teach, uh, charge them that they teach no other doctrine. In verse 4, but add this on to it. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Now, he also, he's not only charging the teachers, but he's also just exhorting the people. He's saying, look, not only do some people teach it, that's not the only problem. Some people are constantly looking for something new. An endless genealogy and a fable. You know a lot of what the, uh, the Jews in Jesus' day had done. They were well versed in the scripture. But they were also well versed in the tradition of the fathers. And there are many Jewish writings. And the Jews today still follow those far more than they do the Bible. The Bible is more or less like a museum relic that they honor. And then the writings of the tradition of the fathers... That's what, how they run their religion. So you think back, for instance, the, uh, in the law, uh, the old Pharisee would say, well, I've got some money I've dedicated to God. He'd put that money in the bank, and nobody could touch it, and nobody could spend it. Somebody says, well, sir, you've got an old age's father here. He's barely getting along, can't pay the rent. Uh, he's not eating well. Can't you take care of him? Well, I don't have any money because all my money is dedicated to God. And they use that as an excuse not to take care of their, their parents. They uh, came up with traditions that violated the scripture. Well, evidently in the days of Timothy, it wasn't much different because he said folks were listening to fables and endless genealogies. And they, what did they do? They minister questions rather than godly edifying. You know, I've been around uh, people even today, and they may be somewhat orthodox, but they'll come up with some type of new approach uh, to some kind of a passage, and it causes people to question more than it edifies them. You know, I think about the hyper-Calvinist. You know, a hyper-Calvinist, if you ever talk to a guy that's hyper-Calvinist, that's all he talks about. I mean, that's all is on his mind. Every doctrine, you could bring up uh, a passage out of uh, Second Chronicles chapter 8 about the genealogy, and he'll say, well, there's a list of the elect. I mean, just everything, his whole subject is the so-called doctrines of grace. Now, I believe in grace, and I believe it's taught in the Bible, but it ends up with people questioning, well, I wonder if I'm one of the elect. I wonder if I really am persevering and so forth. It can cause questions rather than godly edifying. You've got people that are the opposite of that. Uh, it wouldn't be so much in a Baptist church, but I've been around people like this, and, and they've always got to qualify the assurance of salvation with, with I hope so. I sure hope I can hold out. I mean, I, I, I love God, and I plan on being to heaven. I hope I make it. What well, that causes questions rather than godly edifying. But you know what causes godly edifying? Is the pure word of God and his promise that you trust. I mean, the Bible's simple enough to understand. He says, don't, don't spend your time on these uh, endless genealogies and things that minister questions. But then that's the negative part. But he says, okay, look, that, you know it exists. You know people are going to teach this part of it. He says, but let's, let's go back now and let's, how, how do we handle this, Timothy? You're going to be, a, a, obviously, you've got people that know the law. You're going to deal with people that have this background in the Old Testament. And we talked about last week, we kind of went briefly through it. But, you know, obviously this, the Bible that was written to Adam, he's responsible for it. I wasn't there when he said it to Adam, but I read it now as an outsider. It wasn't written to me, but it's written for me. The law is the same way. I'm a Gentile, but even if I was a Jew today, the law wasn't written to me. God gave it to a certain generation, gave it to them to be responsible for, to use it the right way, and yet we don't throw it away today. It has a profit, because notice what he says down in verse 8. We know that the law is good, if a man use it lawfully. You know, God's law still has a purpose. I mean, it's God's word. Every part of this Bible is profitable. See, think about in this very book to, to Timothy. In the second Timothy, we read the passage that said, study to show yourself approved unto God. 
a workman that needed not to be ashamed, but also 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. All Scripture is profitable for doctrine, correction, instruction, and righteousness. It's all profitable, including the law. But I've got to use it lawfully. Now, look back to verse 5. He's talking about the commandment. He says, now the end of the commandment. And if you want to put in there any of God's commandments, the end, for God to direct us as a believer now, um, a Jew never viewed it like this. Many of the Jews, they missed this. And yet, what did Jesus say was the first and great commandment? To love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Well, of course, that's the first commandment, but the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, most people talk about the Old Testament. I'm talking about ignorant people, don't know much about the Bible. They, uh, that would be so audacious as to say we ought to get rid of it. It came up, oh, not too long ago. Uh, they're talk, talk, you know, putting these um, books. I don't even want to talk about the subject matter of them in the pulpit. They're so bad. And they want to be in our kindergarten classes. I mean, they're putting them in libraries in absolute filth and disgusting. Uh, you know, it's interesting. They want to, and this is true. They put these books in the libraries of elementary schools. I read a news story that was going to tell us what kind of books they were putting in there, what was controversial, and it had a disclaimer at the top about the kind of material that was going to be in this article. I mean, you might want to use discretion when you read this. You know how sometimes it's going to be violence. Uh, it says there's subject uh, uh, sensitive material going to be discussed in this article, and they put it in an elementary school. So somebody stood up and said, oh, oh, well, we've passed the law now. We've got to get this stuff out of the school. Then we've got to take the Bible out. Why? Well, the Bible talks about stoning homosexuals and talks about killing people that commit adultery, and it's all full of... They don't know what's in this Bible. Do you know what the emphasis of the book they're criticizing is? Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, if you're a fundamental, Bible-toting, God-loving, Jesus-serving, I mean, he means everything to you and you want your whole life to count for him, you go out and you try to tell people how much Jesus loves them and so they can stay out of hell. If you're a Koran-toting, Muhammad-serving, uh, Allah-touting, I mean fundamental Muslim, you go out and terrorize things. I mean, that's right, isn't it? I mean, if you're a liberal Muslim, you're like, I'm a peaceful person. Well, that means you don't believe the Koran. I'm just kind of take it lightly. I just think it's there. It's, it's symbolic. I mean, if you believe it's symbolic, then that's fine. You can be a peaceful Muslim and be, that's fine, no problem. But if you really believe what it says, I mean, it says what it says, you force people to serve Allah. Now, I am a fundamental, unapologetic, Bible-believing Christian, and I don't force anybody to do anything. I have a message. I believe so much in the power of that message that I believe God will change your life if you listen to it. I don't twist your arm, terrorize you. Uh, I'm, I don't have to protest to make you saved. Now, I can protest political issues. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but I don't, uh, we don't protest. We don't force. Um, God gives you an op opportunity to, to use the Bible lawfully. This Bible has a commandment, and the commandment is love. Notice again in verse 5, the end of the commandment is charity or love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. You know, that's the goal. That's a pretty good goal, isn't it? Here's what God's, you want to know what then, he's, he's introducing the law. Uh, we don't today, I mean, we're, we've, the law has been fulfilled. As a Christian, I must put the law in its proper context. It's good if I use it lawfully. But I don't grow as a Christian by the law. That's not my, I don't go to that. It, it contributes to my knowledge of the Bible, which helps me to grow. But the law itself is limited for the Christian. You say, well, how can God's word be limited? Well, it's not. Our flesh is. What the law could not do. See, there's something the law couldn't do. What the law could not do, Romans 8, 3, in that it was weak. You mean God's law is weak? Through the flesh. Nothing wrong with the law. The problem is those that was given to can't keep it. 
but it has a purpose. Now, the end of it, start at Genesis, go to Revelation, and you'll find out the end, of course, is to exalt Jesus, but he says the end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart and a good conscience and genuine faith. That is unhypocritical, not faked, just good old faith in the Bible. That's a pretty positive thing, isn't it? He says that's the end of the commandment. That's the goal. Now, some in verse 6 have swerved, have, are swerving, have turned aside unto vain jangling. Now, we could talk about the secular world's vain jangling, but he's talking about religious vain jangling. They're going to take religious terms and use them the wrong way. Now, we, of course, today have probably more options. Um, there's plenty of, you can find a false religion to go along with just about anything. Now, there can be categorized. We, some of them we look at it almost like cults, and they are. Uh, some of them are considered more mainstream. But you know, if I were today, and I'm not slandering them, I think you would pretty well know uh, what a Muslim, I mean, I'm sorry, what a Mormon teaches and what a Jehovah's Witness teaches is far from what we believe the Bible teaches, because it's far from what the Bible teaches. Uh, we don't believe the same thing, so we kind of look at them, we categorize them and say, okay, yeah, that's, they're just on a completely different level. But you know, there are mainline denominations today that even though we recognize the name uh, a Presbyterian, Methodist, including Baptist, I mean, mainline denominations today that are so liberal that even though they're not technically what we classify as a cult, they're so far from this Bible, they're just as lost and just as dangerous. I mean, they got people in front of them, they're up in a pulpit and they get up and tell them that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, that there's a bunch of myths in the Bible, that it was written by man. Uh, and of course, people say, oh, this guy's educated. He's got two PhDs and he knows a lot. And I guess he knows what he's talking about, but he doesn't know what he's talking about. Vain jangling. You know, how vain is it for a man to get up on a Sunday morning and claim to be a preacher and to get up and talk about the Bible for 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, or whatever it is, and he doesn't even believe that the Bible that he's preaching is the Word of God. That's vain, empty, useless jangling. He says it's going to be out there. Some have turned aside. Now, in verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Now, again, we, you can have different levels of people that are just outright heretics, some get off a little bit on a, on a tangent. They're not lost. They're not unsaved people, but they just get off on a tangent. There's mixed up people out there. Uh, there's some people who like to be considered really smart. They just, there's intellectual pride. They get tapped on the back by thinking, oh yes, I'm a great teacher of the law. People respect me for everything I know. And there's nothing better to get you out of sorts with God than just good old pride. I mean, intellectual pride is just as bad as any pride. And so understanding, they don't even understand what they're talking about. But then he says, well, Timothy, let's make sure we do what, know what we're talking about. He says, we know the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Now, are you in Jesus today? If you're in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're righteous. If you're not righteous, you're not going to be in heaven. You say, well, I'm trying to be righteous. That's not good enough. You say, well, I, I live a pretty good life. That's not righteous. Righteous means 100% perfect, sinless, no sin on your account, right with God. Now, there's no way you can do that on your own. The law isn't going to help you do that. So how in the world am I going to be righteous? 2 Corinthians 5.21, He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God made me righteous. Now, isn't that a clear statement? They're rightly dividing the word of truth. Here's a great statement right here. This passage illustrates it so well because it says the law was not made for a righteous man. Now, I'm a righteous man. I'm in Jesus. Now, does it mean there's no profit to me for it? No, the same book's going to tell us all scripture is profitable. But the law wasn't made for a Christian. In other words, it wasn't designed. Its purpose was not to get a Christian to more uh, 
to walk with God in a greater way. That's not the point. Now, don't get me wrong. Reading the Bible, reading the law, reading the law of Moses is a tremendous thing. The Word of God has a cleansing effect. Um, I've read through it many times and gotten a blessing through it over and over, and we see Jesus all the way through it, and it has a purpose. But to take it as given to the Jew, it doesn't help me to make progress in my spiritual life. I mean, it can be illustrated well. Why pick and choose? If, I'm, if I can be helped in my spiritual life, as I mentioned another time, well, I better not did a woolen garment and, and a cotton garment and sew it together, or, or I guess my prayer life will be hindered. Well, no, that was written to the Jew. It wasn't written to me, but I can learn something about it. You know, if nothing else, I can look at that and say, wait a minute, there's something God's trying to teach these people. Sounds like to me, maybe he doesn't want the holy and the unholy to be joined. Maybe he's trying to teach us that can two walk together except they be agreed. Maybe he's trying to show me when he said an ox uh, is not supposed to plow with a donkey and so forth. He said, don't put them together because... uh, Two can't walk together. It was an object lesson. There was a purpose to it. Now, in that, I can grow in my spiritual life because I'm taking it as it was there for me. But as it was written to a Jew, you know what happened if a Jew plowed his ox and his ass together? He sinned. God told him not to do it because it was written for a specific people. So he said it wasn't made for righteous men. But it was made for these people, the lawless and the disobedient, for ungodly and for sinners and for unholy. Well, let's stop there before we look at the rest of the list. Do I have any people in here that at some point in your life were lawless, disobedient, ungodly, and sinners? I believe a bunch of us, right? Now, the law had a purpose for me at that time. It, it, was, it actually was made for me at that time. Now, it was written to the Jew. But do, do you think anybody, is that just Jews? Do you think there's any folks today that are lawless and disobedient and unholy? Yeah, the law's got a purpose. You know what it does? It shows them that they're lawless, unholy, and disobedient. It says it goes a little bit further. Here's how, what it, it deals with for the profane. We got some profane people in this world. Murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, And for manslayers, God divides it out in all three. For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, and for men stealers. You know, the Bible is addressing these sins, and you could either read it in the Bible, or you could turn on the news program tonight and hear about every one of them, except they're not called sin. What would this world be like if the Bible was not around to call sin sin. I mean, imagine the testimony without this Bible. You you know, you go back to the Amorites, uh, the Canaanites, and God told Abraham, he said, I'm going to, you know, keep you people in slavery for 400 years until the iniquity of the Amorites is full. That's what happened to a nation that lived for hundreds of years with no testimony from God. Every heathen practice that you could possibly think of they came up with, and that's how they lived. You know, the Bible, even though everybody's not saved, this Bible stands as a testimony to the world. Uh, when I says it's for whoremongers, well, that's offensive to some people, but God said whoremongers God will judge. For them that defile themselves with mankind, of course, speaking about homosexuality, the Bible declares it's a sin. Uh, for men stealers, you think there's, uh, they, they try to tamp it down like it doesn't exist. Human trafficking is rampant. Right. That's men stealers. And for liars, or well, keep going, preacher, don't, don't stick too long on that now, that, right? Perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. What is the law for? Now, plenty of the Bible deals with these sins, but think about it when you get to the New Testament. Paul, as he writes in some of these epistles, deals with these sins, and he uses as the basis for these sins, God's already decreed back in his holy law that he's against them. But the law doesn't save you, and it doesn't help the righteous man. What is the purpose? It is a, it is a ministration of death. It is a, it is a, a word 
of God's condemnation of what sin is. Why do you need to be saved today if your sin is not a problem? I mean, if, if sin really doesn't offend God. Well, we're in the New Testament age. Now, this is where people get mixed up on the Old Testament, New Testament, grace and law. Oh, well, we're in the, in the age of grace. Why do you need any grace? Because of the law. God told me what I need. Now, the, the error that people have is they, they swing the pendulum the wrong way. Boy, God's law is clear. It's definitely condemned us. So I guess what we need is we need grace, plus we've got to keep that law. No, God gave up on human race. Jesus fulfilled the law. What you need is him. And then you know what he'll do? He'll fulfill it through you. He'll begin to demonstrate to the world that he's able to clean up these things out of our life. And so he says it's got to be used uh, lawfully. Now, how does this coincide? This, this uh, false doctrine was that people were overemphasizing to the Christians the the wrong use of the law. That was their problem. So now he ties them together. He says the law is good if you use it lawfully. Gives us list of sins. But notice now in the last of verse 10. If there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Do you know to, to live against the law without receiving Christ is not sound doctrine. I mean that's, lost people don't have sound doctrine. But there's unfortunately some Christians that don't have sound doctrine. So he says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Now, how do you, uh, how do you put the law in harmony with the gospel? He didn't say in contrast to the gospel. He said, according to the glorious gospel. You know, you might get the idea that God gave Israel the law, and they couldn't keep it, and God says, well, that isn't going to work, so let me come up with plan B. There's no plan B with God. Actually, plan A, which was the only plan, he said it in Genesis 3.15. I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman. Between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. I'm going to send the seed of the woman to crush the devil's head. And he started in motion a plan that was formed before the foundation of the world. Everything after that that God is doing is pointing to that plan. That next era that I talked about after the Tower of Babel, when Abraham received the promise from God, and yes, he lived by the promise. He received revelation. He was responsible. Uh, Israel being in a land and so forth. But what did he promise that day? I'll bless him that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. How are they going to do that? Through the seed. They're going to be blessed. I mean, even when he comes down to the law, before he introduces it in Exodus 19, he said, I bury you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. Now if you obey my voice indeed, well, for I don't know how many hundreds of years, they didn't obey his voice indeed. It made them ripe to look for the one who would come, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed gospel. He said it's right in accordance, it fits, it's in harmony because the gospel implies my need. It's implied that why did Jesus come? He didn't come to just add on something. He didn't come as a religious leader. He came, fulfilled the law, died for my failure of the law and made it possible for me to be declared righteous before God. You know, if a man kept the law completely perfect, and his whole life, he'd be righteous. If you're in Jesus, you're righteous. But now, I'm not only righteous, I'm actually a joint heir with Christ. I mean, if he just saved me and kept me out of hell, that'd be wonderful. But he didn't just take me out of the pit. He set my feet on a rock and established my goings. That's a whole lot better, isn't it? So, to understand, yes, the law exists. The gospel exists. They're not contrary to one another. They harmonize with one another. He said, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And I thank God, Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Paul 
was entrusted with this glorious gospel. And it is a glorious gospel. So I think you understand, and I think we put this together, but the Bible beginning in Genesis 1-1 all the way to Revelation chapter 22 is the Word of God. It is profitable. It confronts me. It changes me. When I read in Psalm 19, which is in the Old Testament, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. God meant that for me. That any Christian can read that verse, and that's what it means. I mean, uh, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? And at that point, all David had was up to just the, the, the law and a, a little bit of the history and so forth. Yes, it's included in that. But when it comes to rightly dividing it, we've got to make sure that we use it properly because the truth is a powerful thing when we take it and lay it down just like God unfolded it. And I trust God will give us an ability to do that. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer.